all, uh, last week we uh, stopped really kind of in the middle of the notes uh, here on page six. Uh, and we are on the topic of self-discipline. Uh, and uh, last week we began on the, on the uh, bigger topic of just how do we handle our freedom and our rights. And so last week we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. And uh, tonight we're going to be going into chapter 11. <clears throat> uh, chapter 10, of course, we covered uh, two weeks ago uh, because, you know, why go through the Bible in order when you can go through it out of order? And that's what, <laughs> that's what we've been doing. Uh, so, like I said, uh, tonight we are going to be in chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, uh, tackling a, a passage that is a little more nuanced and complicated, but I believe we're up to it, and uh, we're going to... Uh, be looking at this chapter in light of this question of how do we handle our freedom and our rights. So let's go ahead and pray and we will get started tonight. Lord, I just want to thank you for this night that you have given us. God, I ask that as we study your word, we will uh, be enriched, uh, be challenged, Lord God, uh, and edified through your scriptures, Lord, tonight. I just pray all these things in your name. Amen. All right. So, uh, chapter 11 deals with uh, two topics. Uh, there's two topics that Paul is addressing in this chapter. Uh, the first one is this issue, uh, uh, this question, I guess you could say, in the churches of um, women covering their head. Uh, and so, we'll get into that in a moment uh, and uh, talk about, you know, what is the context of that? Is that something that still needs to happen? If so, if not, why? Uh, and then the other part, the second half of the chapter, uh, Paul addresses uh, the conduct um, and the attitudes of people during uh, communion and the Lord's Supper. Uh, and both of these we're going to be looking at tonight through the lens of this question, how do we handle our freedom and our rights? Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do here is we're going to read uh, down to verse 16. Uh, which deals with uh, this uh, question of uh, women and men covering or not covering their heads uh, during uh, church services. And we're going we're gonna, to uh, pick this apart a little bit to get at what is it that God is teaching uh, us through this passage. Um, I just want to say this uh, before we go into it that would be helpful to keep in mind. Uh, when we go into passages like this, uh, especially if you read them alone and you just read them at a surface level, uh, it is easy to walk away with this thought process or this understanding that somehow this passage is putting men above women uh, or putting women in, you could say, like a, like a subservient position in the church. Um, and uh, I would say, yeah, if you were to read a passage like this only and didn't have an understanding of the broader context of Scripture, you could easily walk away with that. Um, but when we look at Scripture as a whole, we actually see that the way that God talks to both men and women is on, uh, is on equal footing. Um, both are called in the same way. Both are called to do the same sorts of things, especially in regards to the gospel and ministry. Um, and uh, scripturally as a whole, men are not elevated above women or vice versa, right? So, and, and you know, if, if this were a different study, I could go through, you know, all the different passages that, that show the equality of men and women. Uh, but we're going to see it if we dig a little bit deeper into this passage, where maybe uh, on the surface level you wouldn't see it immediately. Um, but the reason I say all that is because when we come to a passage like this, that maybe at just face value could look like it's placing men above women, uh, women in this sort of sub subservient uh, position. Uh, if you don't understand the rest of the context of Scripture, uh, then you have no way of, of disagreeing with that. Um, but if we know that the rest of Scripture actually actually speaks to the equality of women uh, and, and all the years of ministry and God's calling, uh, and then we read a passage like this that seems to contradict that, then we have to look and go, okay, there's probably something a little more complex happening in this passage than you would catch at a face value reading. And uh, otherwise, then there would be a clear contradiction of Scripture. So uh, knowing that that's not the case, then we need to just dig a little deeper because maybe the meaning we're going to catch on the surface level isn't what's actually being said. Does that make sense? Hopefully. 
I, th I think I phrased that <laughs> properly. Um, sound off in the question or comments if you uh, if I, if I didn't make that clear enough. But yeah, in a nutshell, because we know that Scripture as a whole teaches the equality of men and women, then if we see a particular passage that seems to be suggesting that men and women are not equal, then we have to look at that and go, okay, there's probably something I'm missing here if it looks like this passage says that men and women are not equal because I know that Scripture as a whole teaches that they are. Uh, and that's what we want to look at today. So um, I'm going to read through this and then we're going to uh, uh, cycle through it and just kind of uh, lift out the lessons there that are for us. Because um, it is a little bit more of a complicated passage. Definitely some nuance is there. And so we want to we want to really look at the details to, to lift up the meaning. I'll say this again before we go into it. Uh, you know, the issue of gender, uh, gender roles, um, differences between men and women, uh, the, the various ways in which God has called men and women, the various ways in which God has, uh, you know, created men and women, and the relationship between men and women, we all know is a very complicated topic. Uh, it's not simple. Uh, there's a lot of nuance, right? And then if we also add to that, you know, in the case of this letter that we're reading, 2,000 years um, and very large geographical di uh, difference in terms of uh, cultural differences between us and the city of Corinth, then we also have to understand that, uh, you know, as Paul is writing to this church uh, about gender-related issues, uh, because there's so much of the nuance of the things that they would have assumed uh, that are different from the things that we would assume, it can be very easy for us to misunderstand the things that Paul is writing. Uh, that's really important for us to keep in mind as we read through this. Uh, because uh, there, there are times in some of these letters where, again, if you're reading it just in the context and thought process of a 21st century American, uh, you're going to come at it with a lot of different assumptions and biases than, you know, a first century Greek person would, right? And so things that maybe they would not have understood to be implying that women were, you know, subjected to men or subservient to men, you know, it could be that when they read this, they would have never taken that meaning from it. But from our eyes, as we read it, we are taking that meaning. And so we have to check ourselves and go, okay, well, let's do some, let's educate ourselves here on some of the cultural and, and temporal differences between us and them. So we can understand, well, what is, what is the actual lesson here and, and core thing that we can take away and apply in our lives? And so that's why I hope to do tonight. I am not a Bible scholar and uh, there may be some things that even I miss as we go through. So uh, definitely open to anything that you guys have learned and want to share in the comments, please do so. Um, I'm always, uh, like the rest of you, I'm always in a process of learning and uh, coming to a better understanding of Scripture. Uh, all right, so with all that preface out of the way, let's go ahead and dig in. Um, let's go to, we're going to start right in verse 1 and continue down to verse 16. So he says, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Now I commend you before you rem uh, because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. Since it is the same as if her head were shaving, for if a wife will not cover her head, then she should not cut her hair, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and the glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man, and neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman. 
and all things are from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory? For her hair is given to her for a covering. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. All right. So there's a lot there. And again, like a very simple face level or face value level reading of the passage, right? If you just kind of took it at face value and digging, digging deeper and didn't understand the things that scripture as a whole teaches about the equality of men and women, then you could look at this and go, okay, well, women need to, you know, be submissive and subservient to uh, men. Wives should be subservient to their husbands. Uh, they can't even pray or prophesy. Uh, unless their head is covered because really he's the image of, right? You could, and it seems to be saying that at face value, but I want to go a little bit deeper um, because here's really what's being talked about. First of all, there's a cultural importance of head coverings. Um, head coverings in the Greek world and in the Middle Eastern world of that time, head coverings were culturally significant uh, and to not properly cover your head in various situations. Uh, could be offensive or seen as disrespectful to people. So we have to understand, first of all, there's this whole matter of head coverings that existed in that culture that doesn't really exist in our culture. Um, and so right there, there's a big difference of understanding uh, and, and, and the way in which you and I would read this passage and the way that the Greeks and the Jews of the first century would read this passage and the things that they would assume and the things we would assume. Uh, simply because they had a culture surrounded um, not surrounded by, but that contained uh, significance in regards to what was on your head and what was not on your head. 21st century America, we don't really have that. People don't give a lot of thought to whether your head is covered or not. So that's a, that's a factor we have to consider when looking at the, at the deeper meaning of this passage. Um, but first I want to point out a couple of ways that we know that, that, that one of the takeaways from this passage is not to talk about men being greater than um, or in some higher position than women. Because that, I think, is one of the bigger, one of the most obvious and quick misunderstandings people are going to have when they read this passage. They're going to look at this and go, okay, well, 1 Corinthians 11, 2 through 16 seems to be placing men at this higher position than women. And so the first thing I want to talk about in this passage is how we know that's not what's taking place. Uh, and here's how we know that, okay? So let's go back to verse 3. He says, For I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Okay. When you look at this word that's being translated into the English as head, uh, the original word there is referring to this idea of a source or origin, right? So when he says the head of every man is Christ, Okay. Well, it's not just saying that the actual original language there isn't, while it is true that Christ is the authority of every man, um, that's not what is meant there by head of every man. It's literally saying Christ is the source of every man. Okay. Because um, we could quickly look and go, okay, well, if Christ is the head in terms of authority of a man, that's also true for women. Right? I mean, that's that's obvious, right? Christ is not the authority of men, but he's not the authority of women. He's the authority of all people, men and women, right? So we know that he's not talking about authority here. And we also know that head isn't talking about... So in the context of this verse, when we're talking about this person is the head of this person, we're not talking about authority uh, in the terms of like, I'm in charge of you or I'm greater than you. We're talking about source. We're talking about origins. And so here Paul is simply going through, first of all, the uh, just recounting what we know from Genesis about the created order, right? And so he's saying in the created order, man was created from Christ. Uh, and we know that he's referring to creation here as well because in other passages, Christ is uh, regularly cited as the one through whom the world was created. So we, as we look at the creation of Adam, we know that the creation of Adam came through Christ. Um, and you can go back to John chapter 1, 
uh, to see Christ's role in all of creation. Okay, so he's saying Christ is the source of man. Okay, and then he goes on to talk about how when he says the head of a wife is her husband, or some translations will say the head of a woman is the man, right? Now he's just referring, and you'll see him get more specific about this as we go down. Now he's saying, he's talking about how women were created from man, right? So he's got this order. Man was created from Christ. Woman was created from man. We know this from Genesis. And then he goes back and says, and the head of Christ is God. Now, it's important that there's all three of those parts there and understanding that we're not talking about one person being greater than another. And here's why. Because when we say the head of every man is Christ, the head of every wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God, let me ask you, is there not perfect equality in the Trinity? I think we were looking to say there is. Between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, they, uh, they enjoy perfect equality between each other. So in the same way, so for, if, if we were to read this as, you know, the head of a wife is her husband, if we were to read that as man is greater than woman, then we would also have to then conclude that he's implying that God the Father is somehow greater and therefore unequal with Christ. And yet we know that's not the case. There's perfect equality in the Trinity. That's one of the aspects of what the Trinity is and how the Trinity functions. So we're not talking about inequality. In fact, verse 3 here, when he goes through this, he's talking about differences in the created order, um, but he's not talking about inequality. In fact, he's emphasizing equality. And this is one of the concepts that you'll see in Scripture that isn't very uh, broadly talked about in American culture or in our modern understanding, and that is this idea that equality and being the same uh, don't have to aren't 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 the same thing, right? Um, maybe not. Maybe we phrase that more clear clearly. I'll say this: you can be totally equal with someone and also be completely different. That's possible, right? So equality is not a question of sameness. Uh, in this way, that I think you and I, I, I would hope, would agree. Men are totally equal with women. Women are equal with men. Yet neither one of us, I think, would say that men are the same as women or that women are the same as men. I mean, all you have to do is use your eyeballs to see that men and women are different and yet they are equal. And this is one of the things I think that Paul is stressing here in verse 3. How there is equality uh, while at the same time there being difference. Uh, and uniqueness. And we're going to see this continue through the idea, right? So first Paul is just stressing, look, men and women are not the same. They aren't called necessarily by God to fulfill the same roles in society. But they are equal. We'll continue to see this idea. Okay. So um, let's go down here to uh, verse... Uh, you're going to see him refer to this order again, right? He says, verse 8, For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. Okay. So again, here he's, so he's already established that there's an equality, actually, between women and women, because he's using the same phrasing to compare men and women as he's using to compare Christ with God the Father. Right? And we know there's equality between Christ and the Father, and therefore we know that he's also then implying that there's equality between men and women. But there's a quality with distinction, right? So he's just saying, look, here's the creative order. The creative order is that man was made first and then woman, right? Man, did, right? But and he says, and there's there's differences in the reasons why they were even created. However, let's continue. Uh, he says, verse 11, Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made for man... So man is now born of women, and all things are from God. Okay. Um, I know I'm going at length here to uh, really emphasize this, but it's very important as we properly understand this passage that we also understand that this passage is not talking about there being inequality between men and women. In fact, it's talking about the opposite, that there is equality. So here, again, Paul is referencing, look, we know that this is the historical account from Genesis, right? 
God, through Christ, made the first man. That was Adam. And then it was out of Adam that woman was made. Okay. But then he goes on to say here in verse uh, 11 and 12, he says, look, but now, where do men come from? Men come from women. Right? So the first woman came from man, but now every man comes from a woman. And we know this because everyone who is born is born from their mothers, not from their fathers. Right? Uh, that may, that's just basic biology. So again, emphasizing here um, in a whole nutshell that while there is distinction between men and women, while men and women carry out different functions, and different roles according to God's design and God's calling. This by no means means that there is inequality or that one is greater than the other. And this is why it's so important when he says in verse, verse 11, uh, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman, right? In other words, neither gender is greater than the other, is independent of the other, but there's a mutual need between the genders and therefore there's that uh, uh, additional layer of equality between them. Okay, so he's forcing, uh, um, he, he, he's really emphasizing, is what I'm going to say, he's really emphasizing this idea of equality in the context of the cultural question of women covering their heads. And again, like I was saying, in the ancient world, especially where these guys were at, the, the, uh, um, you can see it in some of these questions that he's asking, right? The reality of the culture is that for the church to gather and women to be prophesying in a way that was covered, uh, you know, with like uncovered heads would have been offensive and would have seemed to the culture as being out of order. So um, really what Paul is doing here is he's encouraging them and saying, listen, you're actually free to cover your heads and do whatever is necessary within the culture in order to honor one another, in order to honor God, in order to not create any issue here for um, for people to have an offense or this, this, have something look unnatural. And in fact, this is where we kind of get to this point of laying down our rights. And I, I shared a few weeks ago, uh, one of the paradoxes of Christianity is that um, the freedom that we have in Christ, the freedom that we have in God, actually enables us to lay those very same freedoms down, right? Because we have freedom, one of the things we are free now to do is to actually submit ourselves to things while not being under bondage to those things, right? So in other words, you could look at it this way. Paul's saying, okay, should women cover their heads? Well, culturally, yeah, you probably should. This is, this is the nutshell of what he's telling them. Yeah, women, when you're in public and you're prophesying, you should cover your heads. And he's saying that to these guys because culturally for them it was relevant. But he's pointing out, he's like, look, first of all, there's nothing wrong with you covering your head because it actually reflects the creation order. At the same time, in no way is you covering your head degrading yourself or implying that you're less than a man. In fact, he's saying, by you covering your head, you're emphasizing the uniqueness of what God has done and created you to be, which is not less than a man or more than a man, but equal with a man, yet distinct from a man. Does, does that flow of logic uh, track? Hopefully, Hopefully it does. Uh, so yeah, let me just kind of walk through that one more one more time because I think that probably best summarizes it, right? So he's saying to women, listen, you can go ahead and cover your head. In fact, I, in, in you can see that he's encouraging them to do that for cultural reasons. Um, and he's saying, listen, you can go ahead and do that because you covering your head is highlighting the uniqueness of who God created you to be. It's highlighting uh, the created order while at the same time, in no way implying that you're less than a man uh, or more than, but that actually because you were equal with a man, you're free to do this and it in no way denigrates you. Uh, it only highlights your uniqueness and it um, honors one another and it honors God. And, uh, you know, and so this is why 
it's so important when we read passages like this. We've got to, you know, dig a little bit deeper because some things in the Bible are pretty straightforward and simple and we can take them at face value. Other things we're going to have to look like this and go, okay, well, what's the culture these people are being written to? What is the relevance here? Uh, because, for example, if you just take it at face value without reading it, you could look and, and go, okay, from verse 14, that no modern man living in uh, 2020 in America should have long hair because it's a disgrace for him. That would be an overly liberal interpretation that I think would be missing the point of what's being said here and also missing the cultural relevance of what Paul is talking about, right? So when we're talking about how do we handle our rights and our freedoms, I would say that the, that the most straightforward application of this for us is that our freedom and our identity in Christ, and who he's made us to be, enables us to lay those freedoms down, even to place restrictions on ourselves, while at the same time feeling no bondage and no weight from those restrictions because we know and we live in the freedom of Christ, right? And so, um, you know, the head coverings are very relevant to them because Paul's saying, I mean, put, think of it this way. If you or I, are ministering to our communities. We're preaching in the church, we're prophesying in the church, we're praying in the church. One of the things that we need to make sure is that there's there's nothing that we're doing um, that is unnecessarily causing a hindrance to people hearing or receiving that ministry, right? So if there is anything culturally relevant that I should be doing, uh, so that I'm taking away any roadblocks or hindrances for people who need to be ministered to to receive that ministry, then I should do those things, right? Um, for example, um, I'll, give you, I'll give you a practical example of, of a time when I did this. When we were in India on a mission trip, uh, we went, and, and it was known that we were, you know, there were American Christians, right, we're going through. Um, and uh, so, you know, it was known, look, we're not Hindu, <laughs> Uh, we don't we don't believe in, in these false gods and, and all these things, right? But we went and we toured through a Hindu temple, uh, mm -hmm. large, sprawling, white marble, uh, you know, architecturally, you know, very, uh, very gorgeous. It's a, uh, you know, located in a, in a, in a high hill in, in the city. Anyway, but we're going through and we took off our shoes as we walked through the temple uh, because that was a sacred place for the Hindu worshipers there. Now, here I am. Uh, a non-Hindu, Christian, Christ-following man. Taking off my shoes in a Hindu temple dedicated to false gods. On one hand, you look at it and go, Sam, what are you doing taking your shoes off? You don't honor these gods. Are you worshiping these false gods? Are you, uh, are you showing respect to these idols? And I would say, no, <laughs> absolutely not. No, what I'm doing is I'm removing any reasonable thing I can to remove what could be a roadblock between me and showing the love of Christ to these Hindu people who need to know it and need to hear it, right? And if I can bring that threshold lower by doing something as simple as removing my shoes, I'm free in Christ, right? Christ knows that my shoes are not being removed out of honor to these false gods. He knows that my shoes are coming off out of love to these people, right? And so the same thing is being said here for women in head coverings, right? Um, not, not this idea of like, women are less than men, men are greater than men, so women, when you're in church, you better cover your head because you're not equal with men. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, listen, you are equal with and distinct from men. And as a matter of cultural relevance, uh, pray with your head covered so that you're not causing distraction, you're not causing people to think that there's disorder in the church, right? And actually, you're free to cover your head while at the same time knowing that that is not degrading you, it is not making you unequal, and uh, it's not saying that you're less than anyone. It's just showing this is who God's created me to be, and I'm free to be that. Uh, so... Yeah, hopefully that uh, unpacks that well enough for you guys. But again, if you've got 
other thoughts or questions, please uh, please jump on and share that. I'd love to uh, hear your questions. Again, this is a passage, to be honest, as I've, as I've gone through it, I've, I've had to you know, study probably more than the other ones because uh, it, it is, it's complex. You know, there's a lot of uh, things being uh, shared here from Paul. And, um, you know, you want to take a look and go, okay, well, how do I understand this in light of uh, the whole of what I know Scripture says about the roles of men and women in the church. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and go to verse uh, 17. Here, Paul is going to address another issue of freedom and rights uh, in regards to uh, the church's participation in communion in the Last Supper. Uh, he says, But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For... In the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are, dis we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment, but the other things, uh, about the other things, I will give instructions when I come. Okay, so a couple things were happening right here around communion. Um, the first and most obvious is the fact that the communion was not being treated with respect and recognition of the things being declared, right? Uh, and so Paul, once again here, has to correct them and say, look, this is the significance of communion. These are the things that we're declaring to be true, right? About uh, who Christ is and what he has done for us. And you're, you're taking in communion. He, he literally says to them in verse 20, he says, you know, you're not, you're not even actually having communion because you've, you've so distorted and so perverted the Lord's Supper that now what you're doing isn't even that, right? It's essentially you're getting together to party. Um, and so, you know, I, I, won't, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but I, I just want to clear up what I think can sometimes be a misunderstanding uh, of the context of, of verse 27 to 30, right? When he talks about drinking and eating uh, the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner and in doing so without discerning the body of Christ, you're drinking judgment on yourself. And for this reason, many of you are weak, sick, and some have died. I've, I've heard this said um, or interpreted to essentially imply that when people have taken communion uh, when they're not saved, that it makes them sick. Or, you know, if they take communion but they're not taking it in the right way or with the right heart or with the right forgiveness, then now, when, once they actually ingest the communion, it will make them sick, uh, and even to the point of something worse than that. Um, I, I do not believe that is the context of, of what's being said here, right? Look at the whole context of the passage. And there is the, this is essentially the idea that um, 
they are literally partying in a gluttonous way for doing what should be a proper communion of the Lord's Supper. And so he's saying, look, because you guys aren't discerning the body of Christ, what he means is because of the fact that you're you're partying, okay, and because of the fact that you're you're just being so undisciplined and this whole you know, you're getting drunk, some people go hungry, some people get drunk, right? It, it, because of this nonsense that's taking place, as a result of the fact that you have drunk this judgment on yourself. As a result of the fact that you are not discerning and you're being so careless, the result of your behavior is that some of you are weak, some of you are sick, and some of you have died. Um, which are very clearly the results of partying, becoming drunk, and all these sorts of things. So Paul, Paul is essentially uh, uh, listing the consequences that they're experiencing because of the way that they're being so uh, just you know gluttonous um, and irresponsible and disrespectful with the Lord's Supper. It's gotten so out of hand that it has actually caused weakness, illness, and death. Okay, um, that is the content. He said that's why he says in verse thirty, "This is why many of you are weak, ill, and some have died." Um, and so that's what I would say is the context there. Now it's still a very it's still a very strong uh, uh, still a very strong command, right? That we need to look at what he says in verse twenty eight. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. This, this is key, right? So Paul is saying, don't take the don't take the uh, the Lord's Supper um, lightly, because essentially, when you treat it lightly, then you're showing that the truth is that you treat the the salvation of Christ lightly, you treat his sacrifice lightly, you treat um, his victory over sin and death for you, you treat all those things lightly. And in treating those things lightly, you're now actually, when you're partaking of the cup and the bread, there's actually judgment coming on you because of how you're being so dismissive uh, about the things of God and the work of Christ. Okay. Now, uh, th that I mean, that's like a whole other lesson to itself, but I really want to focus today on verse 22, because as we're looking at laying down our rights, there's there's another issue that Paul raises here in the way they're going about communion, and that was that there's just like there's there's no there's no equality happening, right? And so um, you know, uh, Corinth was a city that didn't have there, there there was a lot of opportunity in Corinth for inequality because you had some really rich people, you had some really poor people, you had Greeks and you had Jews, right? So there's lots of differences. And so here he's saying, verse 22, he says, look, um, uh, let me, he says, verse 21, for an eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One person goes hungry, another gets drunk, right? He says, do you not have houses, houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? So one of the things that's happening here as they were coming together for communion in the church is that the people who were really rich were turning communion into a party. And not only were they just completely uh, dis disrespecting uh, the work of Christ and the way they handled communion, but they were also humiliating the, those who were less wealthy or even poor in the church by, um, by you know, their partying and having all this big food and the other guys have almost nothing, right? And so that's why he says, I'm not going to commend you for doing that, right? But he ties it back up here in verse 33. So then, my brothers, when you come together, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him go home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. Okay. So part of the idea of the communion table of the Lord's Supper here was this idea of unity and equality within the church, right? And this is one of the things that Paul really wants to emphasize. And, and I believe this is why both of these topics are in the same chapter, right? You see Paul talking about the laying down of rights and the issue of head coverings. And then you also see Paul talking about the laying down of rights when it comes to the Lord's Supper in order that there can be uh, equality uh, between uh, the different members of the church, right? Because when they come together in communion, they needed to be coming together in a way where there was no inequality, 
but everyone was coming to the same table, drinking the same cup, eating the same bread, and being unified under the completed work of Christ and his sacrifice and his victory over sin and death. Okay, so um, I'm just going to recap tonight for the points. So uh, as we're finishing up page six here in our in our outline study of First Corinthians uh, chapter eleven, um, the highlight verses I would say for for the first point uh, is eleven and twelve, and that's this point that because God has made us equal and we are all His, then we can actually sacrifice our rights and privileges without being degraded. Okay, such a key concept, right? Because God has made us equal and because we all belong to him, we actually have the ability to sacrifice our rights and our privileges without being degraded by that. Uh, that's a wonderful reality of living. Uh, and then the, the second point for tonight, really key, is that our relationships should really prioritize equality. And that's verse 21, 22, which we just read in 33 and 34. Uh, so just encourage you uh, this coming week as we uh, continue our study through Corinthians uh, to just really give uh, thought to this idea of our freedoms and our rights. You know, especially key and important as American citizens, we have so many great freedoms and liberties and rights um, that God has blessed us with. Uh, but a biblical approach to our freedoms and our rights is not that we would clutch them and hang on to them and say, I have a freedom... I have a right for this, I have a right for that. We wouldn't hold on to them and say, you can't take my rights from me. No, we would actually, as Christians, say, I, I have these rights as a gift from God, and I gladly will lay them down. I will gladly give up my rights in order to serve and love uh, the people around me and people that God has placed in my path. Right, And I can do that without it degrading me at all because of who I am in Christ, and because of the truth of the equality amongst all brothers and sisters that's found in Christ. Okay, uh, so let's uh, uh, let me just look and see. I've been keeping my eye on the questions and comments to see if there are any, and I don't see any. Uh, but of course, you can always uh, post a question or anything like that uh, afterward uh, if one comes to your mind. And let me just. Do, 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 do. And just uh, so if anyone has any questions, please uh, go ahead and share those. Uh, if not, uh, that's totally cool too. Uh, we will be back next week. We're going to pick up uh, the second half of uh, chapter six of First Corinthians. Uh, the first half of that chapter we covered uh, several weeks ago, back when we were talking about church relationships and confronting sin and offense in the church. Uh, but next week, and this is going to wrap up our topic on self-discipline. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking about the second half of chapter 6, 1 Corinthians, uh, dealing with uh, sex and marriage. Uh, and, uh, and how those uh, play out in a healthy way uh, versus unhealthy ways. And what uh, scripture teaches us regarding those things. So it's actually the second half of chapter 6 and all of chapter 7 is what we'll be covering uh, next week. Uh, same time, same channel, Wednesday night, 7 p.m., Facebook Live. You guys know where to find it. All right, let's go ahead and pray, and we'll wrap up tonight. Lord, we just thank you for your word once again, Lord. Uh, Lord, we know that at times uh, there, are, there are things being, that we're being confronted with uh, from your word that clash with our culture. Uh, maybe, Lord God, they, they clash with uh, the way we've always thought about things. And so... God, I just ask that through your Holy Spirit, you would really just soften our hearts to be receptive to the truth. Uh, that we wouldn't let, you know, the way we've always thought about something or the way that our culture teaches us to think about something. We wouldn't let that get in the way of really absorbing your truth, Lord, uh, and then living it and walking in it. God, I thank you that you have made every one of us, Lord God, equal and yet unique and distinct from one another Lord God you have not called us all to exactly the same role or the same ministry or the same gifts or Lord God but you have called us all equally uh, and there is just this really beautiful uniqueness uh, for each one of us to found in you uh, and so Lord I just pray that as we uh, live out these days ahead uh, that we will come to greater understanding of of those unique things that you have placed in us and called us to be and do. 
uh, and that we would walk and live in them. And I pray your blessing uh, just over everyone tonight, God, in your name. Amen. All right. Well, you guys have a great night, and we will be back again next week. Love you.